Tommy Arayomi received the Lord Jesus at age 15 and began ministry at 16 years old, serving as a pastor on that foundation faith church. In 2019, a few months before the UK went into lockdown, Tommy was led by the Lord to relaunch Reg Nation, which he originally founded in 2007. In April 2020, Tommy launched Pioneers Church as an online church which together with other training and social commentary programs has attracted an international audience of over a hundred thousand subscribers. He is the author of 12 books, the most recent being Eat, Sleep, Prophesy, Repeat and The Cosmopolitan Christian. Tommy is married to his wife Tama and they have three beautiful sons. Please welcome to YAC 2022, Tommy Arayomi. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, can we give Jesus a shout of praise? <laughs> Lift your hands just for one more minute and pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, one, two, three, go. Pray in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for what you're going to do in this amazing place. We thank you for positioning us to be part of of a kingdom takeover for the next 10 years for the sake of Nigeria. But Lord, Nigeria was not formed just for the sake of Nigeria. Nigeria was formed for the sake of Africa. So Father, today we stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the tenets of his scripture that declare that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And upon this precedent, we take back Nigeria from those who believe that it is their right. You said in your word, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. So God, we take back this nation right now we command principalities and powers to behave themselves. We suspend all demonic activity. We command every spell, incantation, witchcraft forged against the righteous to, to, to be rendered null and void now in Jesus' name. Every pit that has been dug, we say, enemy, it was dug for you. Every gallow that has been set, we declare it has been set up for our enemies. We send confusion into the camp of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. And Father, we agree today with all of the amazing speakers and all of the amazing pastors and prophets and fivefold ministers and all of the saints gathered together. We put the enemy to flight. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, amen. Now, uh, just hug somebody next to you and tell them you're glad they're here. Tell them you're in the right place at the right time. Hallelujah. Now, if we can, just stay on our feet for a second and take our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 19. If we can... If you're not otherwise incapacitated, if you don't mind just standing to your feet out of respect for the reading of the word, and then we will be seated. I'm on an assignment today. Uh, in such a short space of time, I want to deliver to you my assignment. It is the next assignment that the Holy Spirit has given me for now till he returns. And it is a new assignment, and I know it will be my final assignment. And so when I'm done with this assignment around the earth, I, will, I know the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so if you'll allow me to release that assignment over you, it is in the book of Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. 
it says, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Somebody say, the king is coming. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 talents and said unto them, occupy till I come. Look at the person next to you and say, occupy till he comes. And you may be wonderfully seated in the house of God. I want to honor the Lord for Pastor Daniel and for his precious wife. Please forgive me if I murder this name. Nifemi, Daniel Olawande. I want to celebrate God for them, uh, for putting on this amazing event. And I want to let you know this is arguably the most important event of my trip to Nigeria. And I'm going to say that, and I don't say that um, lightly. The Lord said to me, this is going to be the most significant reason I've sent you to Nigeria, this meeting. So when you met me here earlier this year, I knew this was a kingdom thing. And so I do have a word for you and your wife, but if you'll allow me at the end uh, just to share that. But I believe it's significant. Why is it significant? The Lord told me, do not take this meeting lightly because you are going to speak to the most important people in Nigeria. And listen, you're talking to a man that's spoken to kings, you're talking to a man that's prophesied kings, prime ministers, met world leaders, ministered at the United Nations. This is the most important constituency standing in this room. I am speaking to the most important people in Nigeria right now. I'm telling you, this is the word of the Lord. When the Lord told me that I was coming here, I was in on the plane to California. I was planning my message in California. Then I boarded the plane to UK. I was planning my message in the UK. I just landed back last night and I couldn't sleep the whole of last night because I wanted to make sure I delivered this right. I don't want to hype you. I don't want to entertain you. I don't want to excite you. I want to ignite you. I want to set you on fire in the right direction uh, because it's one thing to be youth aflame, but it's another thing to be youth aflame in the right direction. The Bible says, zeal for my father's house has consumed me. But can I tell you something? If you have zeal, but you don't know what it's for, it will burn you out. And I don't want you to burn out. I want you to burn through. And so if you'll allow me to be a little bit like Samson tonight. Well, what do you mean? Samson set fire to the tails of foxes and loose them into the camp of the Philistines. I've come to prophesy that God is getting ready to set fire to a couple of young people's tails. And he's getting ready to loose you into the camp of the Philistines. Just let me share this, sit down for a second. Let me share this assignment, let me dispense it. Um, uh, usually 40 minutes is my introduction, so I'm gonna try and preach my message in my introduction. Please allow me for the sake of time to stand on existing protocols and honor all of the platform leaders and guest speakers and amazing men and women of God, some of who I don't know and I've just met, some of who I know uh, very well, who, who um, I, am, I am almost, um, 
in awe of and enamored by uh, the, the strength of such amazing prophetic and apostolic people here in Nigeria. But I want to say something very quickly, um, and I want to share why this is arguably the most important event of my trip to Nigeria. The Spirit of God was speaking to me expressly through the night and this morning about the young people in this nation. And I want to let you understand something that you may already know, but under 25s represent the largest constituency in Nigeria. 50% of Nigeria is under the age of 25. Let me say it again, 50, and I may be wrong, it may be a little bit more, but averaging about half the population of Nigeria is under the age of 25. That represents in itself a wave of people that if you shoot them in the right direction can actually tip the scale of Nigeria irreversibly. But I want to say something to the Nigerian youth, and I want to help you understand the assignment is this. One day, and this is where the Lord shifted my assignment forever. I used to think that my assignment was to raise the prophets. I used to think that my assignment was to restore the prophetic and apostolic back into the house of God. And I am an unapologetic prophet. I'm not a pastor. I'm unapologetic in my prophetic ministry, my prophetic assignment and my prophetic call. I know the grace of God that rests upon me. I, I, I've seen and witnessed that God has not let my words over nations fall to the ground. But I'm saying this to let you know that for a long time I assumed that my assignment was to restore the prophetic until one day I had an encounter with the Lord and it was literally just the end of last year. And in this encounter myself and Jesus were on an airplane together. And as we're on this airplane, the Lord is speaking to me in this encounter, but I cannot hear what he's saying because in the vision, I needed to use the bathroom. Have you ever needed to use the bathroom and somebody's talking, but you can't hear what the person's saying because there's an urgency to go to the bathroom? And so as he's talking, I'm trying to put my hand up because you don't want to ignore or interrupt Jesus mid-sentence. But I put my hand up and he notices, and I said, Lord, I need to go to the bathroom. Please, I'll be right back. So I get up in this encounter, and I go to the toilet, but the sign on the toilet door of the plane says occupy. Oh, you're about to get this in a minute. So I went back to my chair and Jesus looked at me and I could hear him now. He said, tell me, why did you go back to your chair so quickly? And I said, master, the sign on the door says occupy. He said, occupy till I come there. Oh, you didn't get that. There ought to be places in the earth. There ought to be places in Nigeria that Satan goes back to hell from where he came from. He doesn't need to knock. He doesn't need to ask who's in there because the sign on the door already says occupy. The end time assignment of the Spirit of God in this final hour is going to be this. Occupy till I come. Look at your neighbor say occupy till he comes. He did not say occupy till you're tired. Where's the church? I'm sorry, I keep looking over here. Where's the church? Let me come. He did not say occupy till you're tired. He did not say be preoccupied till I come. He didn't say watch Netflix till I come. He didn't say sit in a lazy boy chair till I show up. He didn't say have a lazy end time eschatology that says Jesus is coming back to save us from this hell hole. He said occupy till I come. Look at your neighbor and say the assignment. Okay, find somebody who looks less suspicious and tell them the assignment is occupation till Jesus comes back. Now watch this. 
occupying armies, according to the United Nations Charter, are not to be mistaken for infantry. Listen, if you don't shout, I'll preach to myself. <laughs> occupying armies are not to be mistaken with infantry. Infantry are called conquerors. Wait, you're going to shout in a minute, don't worry. Infantry are called conquerors. In 2006, when Obama became president, he took over Afghanistan. And when he conquered Afghanistan, he defeated the Taliban, tore down the caliphate, and by releasing airstrikes into Afghanistan, and then once he did it, Obama became a conqueror. <laughs> After he released what is called the occupying army, Oh, help me preach this today. The assignment of the occupying army is not to conquer. You see, there was a reason why Joe Biden, the people were upset in America with President Biden because he withdrew the occupying army. And anytime the occupying army withdraws, the enemy takes advantage of a vacuum. The assignment of the occupying army is not to invade because the invasion happened in a previous administration. The assignment is not to invade because the invasion happened in a previous administration. Let me say that one more time. The assignment is not invasion because the invasion happened in a previous administration. All Joe Biden had to do was occupy somebody else's victory. All Joe Biden had to do was secure a victory that had already been won in a previous administration. Watch this. Evander Holyfield fights Mike Tyson and he defeats him in a knockout blow. Evander Holyfield becomes a conqueror. He lifts up the heavyweight title in the air as the world declares Evander Holyfield a conqueror. Evander Holyfield then takes the check of $14 million and gives it to his wife. His wife cashes the check, goes to the shop and buys Gucci, Prada, Louboutin. Oh, the church just woke up. Okay, and, and, and buys Fendi. Evander Holyfield is a conqueror. His wife is more than a conqueror. I wish I could get somebody to help me preach today. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross and overcame the enemy. 2,000 years later, his bride picks up the check of his victory. You are more than a conqueror. Oh. Come on, tap somebody in case they don't know and say, I'm more than a conqueror. Tell them I'm more than a conqueror. Listen, Nigeria, the reason I start here is because the enemy has convinced you that you are somehow here to, 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 uh, to finish something that Jesus started. You're not here to finish what Jesus started. You're here to start what he already finished. It is finished on the cross. He didn't say it's almost finished. He said it is finished. Listen. It's already finished. Nigeria's already 
already saved. Nigeria is already blessed. Huh? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And if you've ever watched wrestling, if you ever watch WWE, you know the fight is already fixed and The Rock always wins. I wish I had somebody to help me preach this message today. Jesus didn't say it's almost finished. He said, it is finished. Watch this. What is finished? I only have a few minutes to tell you what is finished so that you can know what you're occupying. You're occupying a victory. You're not occupying for victory. You're occupying from victory. You already have victory. You're occupying from that place. The enemy is working hard to convince Nigeria that Nigeria is defeated. No, no, no. Last time I checked, not even Satan was defeated. Satan is destroyed. That is a level beyond defeat. That means it is incapable for him to regain a place that he has already lost. Come on, somebody shout. I got to get this done quickly. I got to get this done quickly. Psalm 2 says, ask me now and I'll give you nations as your inheritance. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. He said, watch this. I've overcome the world, therefore go. Watch this. I've overcome the world, therefore go. Watch, watch carefully what he's trying to say here. You see, Jesus overcame the world. So the question is, if he overcame it, why is Nigeria still where it is? I'm going to help you. He overcame the world with one simple principle. All dominion is not measured solely by land space. True dominion is measured by air superiority. According to the United Nations Charter, it is called the degree of air control. The assignment of nations is to dominate the earth and be locational at the same time. Watch this. That's why seats and thrones are very important, but watch. The assignment of nations is this. How do I dominate the earth but be geographical at the same time. The only way for you and I to dominate geographically and yet own globally is if we understand true dominion is not just lateral, it is also longitudinal. I'm going to explain something. I, I, I don't have much time, but watch this. Um, uh, the degree of air control determines who dominates. The, the Great Commission is go, but the first omission, do, uh, commission is have. Let me come over here for a second. The Great Commission is go, but the first commission is have. Have dominion. Watch this. You only truly dominate when you are positioned in the air. When King John Un decided to act crazy, Donald Trump said, listen, if I want to, I can bomb you. Watch this, Donald Trump did not need to visit North Korea. He just needed to send some war jets to fly over North Korea. 
Watch this. He was saying here, you may own the ground, but I own the air. Huh? And because I own the air, I determine what owns the ground. He's saying, Kim, the only reason you're here is because I give you permission to be here. But don't make me drop this bomb and show you the true might of America. So Jesus said, when I'm lifted up in all the earth. Oh God. Oh God, help me. Jesus said, I must ascend. Lucifer never said, I'll go out. Lucifer said in Isaiah 14, I will ascend. Because everything in the spiritual world knows the power of air control. This is why Lucifer is called the prince of the power of the air. Because the assignment of Lucifer is air control. He don't care how many churches you own, Nigeria. He don't care how many churches you plant. He'll let you build your cute little empire churches and your big ministries. As long as you don't touch the airspace, he's fine. Build your church. Have your little tent. Make it a mega church. Build a mega dome if you want to. Just don't touch the air. It's called air supremacy. Air supremacy determines the degree of dominion of one nation against another nation. And this is why the Holy Ghost was hovering over the face of the air, because let me tell you something. You cannot affect the ground until you own the airspace. The air determines the ground. What is operating in the atmosphere determines what can happen on the ground. It's called air control. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For you said in your heart, I will ascend. I will set my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the Most High, and I will be like the Most High. But you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lower pits of the earth. Now, I want to explain very quickly why the earth is still the way the earth is. Can I help you with this? Jesus dies on a cross. What is the significance of his death? First thing you have to understand is you must understand kingdom protocols and you must understand biblical protocols if you're going to understand why Nigeria is still the way Nigeria is. I'll tell you why. God cannot move Satan out. I'm going to come over here. God cannot move Satan out. If God was to move Satan out, he would cease to be God. Watch this. There is something called kingdom protocol. And because we're a democracy, we don't understand kingdom protocols. Kingdom protocols is this. In a king is judicial, legislative, and executive power. A king does not have a division of powers. That's why scripture says, man of God, when a king speaks, who dares ask him why? In the word of a king, there's power. The moment a king says something, it is legislative, it is executive, it is judicial. It does not go through House of Commons, it doesn't go through House of Lords, it doesn't go through Senate, it's just his word. So when Esther came to Xerxes and said, could you change the decree that you've made that my people should die? The king said, I cannot change it. Because when a king speaks, if a king changes his word, his kingdom becomes questionable. So the king said to Esther, what I can do though, is I can make another testament. Oh, some of you are getting it. This side's getting it. You see, God can't 
change the Old Testament. He can only make a new testament. It's called the God dilemma. The moment God speaks something, God cannot change God's word even for God. Psalm 138 says, my word have I established above all my name. If God was to change his word, the moon would come crashing out of the sky. The planets would lose their orbit. Why? Because he upholds and sustains all creation through the power of his word. I'm going to explain something. When the God dilemma, the God dilemma is the moment God speaks, God cannot change God's word for God. The moment God creates Lucifer, God gives Lucifer something that he, can, he can't take away. He said, Lucifer, you are now eternal. One day I was, I was evangelizing and somebody came to me, a mother and daughter, and they said, if God is so loving, why did he make hell? Why, why can't he just kill us? Why does he make us suffer forever? Because you have to understand the moment God speaks, he cannot change his word even for himself. So the moment God makes an eternal Lucifer, he must construct an eternal space for an eternal being to die eternally. Are you hearing this? I call it the God dilemma. The moment he speaks, he can't change what he says even for himself. Now you're about to get something. Let's take our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28 very quickly. Ezekiel 28. If you're there, say amen. What's this? How art thou fallen from heaven? Ezekiel 28 verse 13. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning. Watch this. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. This is Lucifer. Watch this, verse 13. You were in Eden. I wish I had somebody to help me. Somebody said, how did Satan get into the garden? The garden was his home before the garden was your home. So how did he get in? He belonged there. The Bible says you were in Eden, the garden of God. But he walked from earth to heaven. Lucifer trafficked between earth and heaven. He moved between the stones of God. He was on the mountain and he was with the people. He was on the mountain and he was with the people. And one day with the people, he caught the praise and didn't bring it back to God. So God threw Lucifer back to earth. Why? Because earth was his home. And if you don't understand, the protocol of God is this. Let me finish here. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. If God gives Lucifer Eden, he cannot take it back. He has to manifest somebody in his image that he didn't make the same promise to and he tells that person be fruitful multiply replenish the earth and subdue and have dominion for this reason was the son of man made manifest that he might destroy the works of the Watch this. So God's like, God's looking and he, one day in Isaiah, the Bible says, and I looked among them and I saw that there was no man. Because uh, God's dilemma is he can't move the enemy from earth. He can move him from heaven, but he can't remove him from earth. So God has to make somebody in his image a new covenant and he says you go deal with him watch this watch this I'm almost done God said dust you are dust you shall return but you have to understand this about kingdoms how do you break an unbreakable bond like a king's word you cannot vote it out you did not vote it in 
Watch this. The only way to break the king's word is the king that gave that word has to die. The only way a king's word breaks is if the king that gave that word dies. So when the king died, the law died with that king. But Satan didn't know that that king was about to rise again on the third day. Make another decree. Nigeria. Here's where the word of the Lord comes in. Then I'm going to sit down. The Lord said, tell Nigeria's youth, do not sell your birthright for your stomach. Genesis 25, 23 is Nigeria's scripture. Two nations are in thee. Two nations are in you. Two nations are in you. Two nations are in you. There's a Jacob in you. There's an Esau in you. But the word of the Lord is this. Do not sell your birthright for your stomach. Esau lost the nation because he was hungry. Young people of Nigeria, I know you're hungry. I know this nation hasn't done you well. I know they're leaving you poor and uneducated, but let me tell you this. You would rather starve than sell your nation out. You should rather starve than sell your nation for your stomach. Don't let anybody come and buy your vote. Don't let anybody come and sell the nation out of your hand. Watch this. Do not sell your nation. The future of Nigeria now hangs in its young people's hands. Nigeria, your young people are the future of Nigeria. And what is going to tip the scale of this election? is going to be a young people who may be hungry, but they're hungrier to see their nation saved than they are to sell their birthright to a supplanter. If that's you, just lift your hands right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I prophesy to this army I speak to this generation. The next assignment is Occupy. You descended in order that you might ascend, in order to fill all things. You did not ascend to fill the church. You ascended to fill everything. Fill government, fill media, fill entertainment, fill business, fill family, fill education, fill medicine. It is time for the saints in Nigeria to occupy till Jesus cracks the sky. I declare right now a new commissioning over you in the name of Jesus. God is getting ready to lift you out of humble places. He's getting ready to set the low on high and the high down low and you're getting ready to see that when men are cast down in the earth the Lord says you will say there is a lifting up